Welcome, my name is Emma Gladstone and I run Dance Umbrella Festival and um, I just wanted to say thanks to the Mayor's Office for working with us on these talks. Um, we've got four panellists today and we've got another session tomorrow. We wanted to have a session about dance and on this occasion for Dance in London. Um, it's partly because it's where the Mayor's Office is and uh, in our Mayor we have one of the few politicians who I think um, really gets what we do. But I know there are lots of people here from outside London uh, and I do want to welcome them also for joining us and for their interest and support. Um, so first of all, um, I would like to kick off by introducing Jacqueline Rose from the Mayor's Office, who's just going to say a few words before we dive in. Over to you, Jacqueline. Thanks very much. And I have to apologise, I cannot get the video function to work. So um, bear with me, but um, I can certainly see all you and it's lovely um, to, to see so many of you. So welcome. I'd love to say welcome to City Hall, but um, here we go. Um, so I, we have been uh, inundated with requests actually um, for this session, um, taking us to 200, 300 people. Um, but it's heartening to know that people want to be connected through this wonderful art form uh, across the capital. And we hope that this session will be fruitful and challenging, um, but fully acknowledge that um, we are in the most difficult times ever. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Jacqueline Rose. I'm one of the senior managers in the culture and creative industries team at the mayor's office, um, but formerly big dance director for a decade uh, from 2006 and 2000 to 2016. So as Emma said, we're hosting these two round tables uh, to bring together representatives from, the London, from London's dance industry to really share intelligence reflections about the current situation and hear more on what the, what the sector's plans are looking like and the thinking uh, for exiting lockdown. So thanks to Emma for the chair uh, for these uh, sessions. Um, and this, today's discussion will be on performance venues and spaces and tomorrow's will focus on artists and makers. So this, is, this really is a genuine open invitation for you to share your ideas and approaches of how you think City Hall can help contribute to the recovery of dance in the capital. So the aim of today really is to provide a space for you to share ideas and approaches um, and also um, for open and honest conversations, uh, which hopefully will try to look forwards. But before we begin, I just wanted to let you know briefly what we've been up to at City Hall. For those of you that have not been so engaged, we have scaled up uh, the Culture at Risk Office, which is our frontline crisis management service for organisations, which has received and responded to 500 cases, 415 from premises based organisations and 93 from freelance individuals since the 1st of April. And um, through the Mayor's 2.3 Culture at Risk Business Support Fund, we've made our first awards to organisations such as Rich Mix and Shea Parts. We've committed 5 million into the London Community Response Fund alongside 50 other funders to create a total pot of 18 million in emergency funding for charities. And to date, 16 million pounds has been awarded, uh, which has included 1.1 million pounds for arts organisations. We paused or reprioritised our flagship programmes such as London Borough of Culture and our Events for London programme in Trafalgar Square, for example, to support the sector through this crisis. We're in regular contact with the DCMS, the Arts Council, Industry Bodies, City of London, London Councils, the Metro Mayors, London Partners, Association of Leading Visitor Attractions, the Creative Industry Federation and many other people and funders. So we've been hosting a number of roundtables with people to just gather intelligence on exit and recovery from lockdown. And, we've, um, and these have included um, creative workspaces, diverse led and diverse serving organisations, freelancers and the self-employed, high streets, nighttime businesses, LGBTQ plus spaces, grassroots music venues, local authority culture leads and higher education performing arts institutions. Uh, we've been chairing weekly World Cities Culture Forum meetings to learn about learn from global policy and some of the international strategies um, other cities are using to re-establish cultural tourism, tourism in major cities, about which you'll hear shortly. Uh, we've written to government ministers advocating for the future of the culture sector, in calling, including calls for improved support for self-employed and enhanced support for the culture sector. We're supporting the Mayor's London Together campaign, its pay it forward crowdfunding platforms, and I'm sure you're now aware that we're planning to set up the Mayor's Commission for Diversity in the Public Realm. 
We've also jointly commissioned research with the Creative Industries Federation from Oxford Economics into the impact of COVID-19 on London's creative industries. And you will see that the results announced today with the devastating projections that the creative sector will be hit twice as hard as the wider economy and experience a loss of one in five created jobs. However tough the times are, our work and commitment continues and today is about the dance sector and understanding your thinking and what more we can do at the Mayor's office to be doing to reactivate dance in the capital. So finally, just to thank Emma for chairing and all the speakers for their presentation and reflections. So thank you and over to Emma. Thanks a lot, Jacqueline. It's good to hear. Um, we wanted to do a dance focus uh, particularly because I do think there are lots of issues that are specific to us. An obvious one is just around the issues for social distancing. Um, another is how many in our workforce are freelance. Um, I think in the urgency of the Black Lives Matter movement, it's also something that we need to discuss as a sector. I don't know if you saw the news today that um, Reni Endo Lodge's book, um, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race, has become uh, the bestseller. It's the first time a black British author has topped that list since it was established in 1998. Um, we want to acknowledge the mental health issues for a lot of dancers that are used to daily classes and performances and the change of not having those endorphins on a regular basis in their bodies, um, but also I think particularly to ensure that the issues and concerns and ambitions of dance are heard alongside those of theatre. I so often feel I hear when performance is talked about, um, it's usually uh, theatre that is referred to and I want to change that and I hope we might change that today in our discussions. So I think there's clearly many different areas and urgent need for change here and I do think we all have a role to play in that process of changing and of thriving and, and of confronting systemic injustices. And I hope this afternoon, I know we only have an hour, but it feels like a beginning at least to listen, to learn uh, and to support each other as we go through what are such incredibly testing times. So um, the focus on today is performance and venues, and it's just got a very simple frame. There's uh, an international overview, a national tour and company view, um, a London festival perspective view, and then a local London organisation view. So I would like to hand over now to uh, Jackie McNary, who's the programme manager at the World Cities Culture Forum, to speak for a few minutes. So Jackie, over to you. Thanks, Emma. Um, hi, I'm another one of the senior managers in the Culture and Creative Industries Unit at City Hall. Um, and uh, I lead on one of the projects, the World Cities Culture Forum. So I'm going to share my screen, hopefully, with you now. Oh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Ah, <laughs> can I share my screen? Host? Is that yep, somebody? yep, that will be being done. Just bear with us a minute. So the World Cities Culture Forum, while we're waiting, is a network of 40 cities around the world. It was something that London launched um, in 2012, and uh, it's grown from eight cities to 40 cities now. And they're senior cultural leaders who all understand the importance of um, culture to world cities. Uh, I'll just try again. Right, okay, I can try here. Um, hopefully, this is coming up. Yeah. Right, okay. Um, so I'm just going to talk you through. So um, so the, the, the forum has been going for eight years and normally we would, um, we would have an annual summit, we would uh, issue reports and do, you know, different things. But during, since the crisis, we've had to completely um, reimagine the way that we work together. And one of the things that we're doing is having weekly uh, webinars talking about the challenge of um, you know, leading uh, cities uh, and uh, supporting the culture sector during this crisis. Um, and as we and we've talked about everything from cultural tourism to reopening to uh, visitor um, safety to visitor sentiment. Um, and there are have been sort of ten emerging themes that have have seemed to come um, back again and again. Um, it's things like culture online, the rush to digital, so much stuff is going online now, but then the challenge is for artists and organisations actually how do you monetize that when so much of it is free and people expect it to be free. Um, looking at you know, how you reopen in a safe way, um, regulations, 
uh, what do people think about, um, you know, how are the public feeling about confidence, about coming back to venues? Um, so then the, the whole issue of equity and inclusion and how this, this um, crisis is affecting that even more in terms of access to culture. Um, we've talked in, and you've mentioned before about the impact on the freelance sector. Um, cultural tourism, then the move actually away from when so many cities are saying, well, not many, you're not going to get many international tourists are so actually now refocusing on your local audience. Um, so there's some of the, the, set, the main themes. Um, and Am Amsterdam and Helsinki gave us a presentation recently and they, they are now thinking, uh, because in Europe it's a 1.5 metre social distancing, but they are just saying for the time being, for the, you know, the next sort of year or so, it's how do you live and reimagine um, what life is as a 1.5 metre society. Um, so some of the reopening measures that um, we have been looking at and hearing from other cities is the fact that, um, you know, it's all about reducing contact. So everything, you know, a lot of um, cities and venues are saying, well, you can, you have to book in advance. You cannot just turn up um, and you have to have sort of self-scan tickets. Um, there's all sorts of implementations in um, venues in terms of um, putting up perspex barriers between staff and visitors. Um, and being really clear in demonstrating your social distancing guidelines. Um, I was on a call this morning and we were hearing from Vienna, Dublin and um, other cities about what is in museums and galleries, what is the capacity and Vienna started off at, at 10 metres um, per person, then it reduced to four metres uh, and 10 metres with a mask, then it reduced to four metres and now today it's one metre and no mask. So things are changing and then Dublin were reopening with 10 metres. So it's, it's everybody's just sort of learning from each other and I think as they open then they, they change. Another thing to look at is opening hours. I mean we heard actually from Kew Gardens recently that they, they usually are opening 10 to 4 but they they've been inundated, so many people want to go there, but actually now they're think, talking about, well, they'll open at eight in the morning, and actually will they open much longer to try and fit um, you know, more uh, people in. Um, and this is some slides from Alva. Alva, many of you may know, is the Association of Leading Visitor Attra Attractions. And Bernard Donahue, who um, runs Alva, is one of the mayor's cultural leadership um, board advisors and he has been running some really useful seminars and this was a presentation from the Swiss Transport Museum who reopened recently and this was them last year at Easter um, uh, 2019 and this is a year later um, and so I think these, some of these images just show you sort of how they've implemented the new loads of communication you know, face masks. Um, face masks off are included within your entrance um, going to this museum. And as you, you enter, they're, they're having to monitor. It's very clearly they, they have a set limit of how many people they can allow in. And they're having to monitor that. But they're having to make really demonstrate and have lots of communication all around the venue. And one of the things they said is all the communication, there's a lot of green and blue. They're not using red. It's all about trying to be positive in your communications. And this was another one in terms of just really being clear, um, you know, that the, to keep your distance and to keep washing your hands. And this was just a demonstration of, you know, if, if you're going into the movie theatre, you need to make sure that there are seats between, you know, you could have a couple, you could have a single person, you can have a family, but within each group, there has to be distancing between them. Um, other reopening measures that we've been hearing about is um, in terms of health, um, particularly in Asia, a lot of the um, cities are implementing temperature testing as you go into a venue. Uh, in Chinese cities, uh, resident um, individuals have a, a health app and you're given a green, amber or um, red uh, code and so if you're green or amber you can probably get in but if you're red you can't. Uh, face masks we talked about, um, hand sanitizers, um, there's uh, you know in, it has to be distributed throughout the organization um, and increased cleaning requirements. Um, actually we heard in Germany that the one dance example I do have is that um, dance rehearsal studios were told that they had to uh, clean once an hour um, to you know so there's really really enhanced levels of cleaning. Um, in terms of um, 
uh, other uh, cultural venue guidance. Um, there are some uh, um, cities that we're hearing of, there's national guidance, and then you have industry bodies, particular in London, for example, the film industry have really got together and come up with a whole load of um, particular guidelines so that they can get back to filming as soon as possible. Um, and in, in Netherlands, they're doing it sector by sector. Uh, we had an example from Paris of the Giacometti Museum who are, are reopening and they are sending out lots of information in advance so that when people turn up they know what to expect to try and make it a better experience for people. Um, going back to the Swiss Museum, this is just an example of they've actually throughout the museum they've got these big oil barrels and so it's a really clear sign that's where you can go you can get your hand sanitizer and they even have a map to show you the different parts of the museum and where you can get hand sanitizer. So it's all about um, public reassurance and giving people confidence that you as a venue are ready and you are following the, you know, as many guidelines as you can. Um, Thank you. We're going, to, um, we're going to need to hand over for the signers. Um, um, so I just need to ask you to wrap up reasonably quickly before a question, the last, don't mind. The last slide is, re is really just, um, you know, different different sec different parts of the culture sector have different rules and regulations. So it's just you know being uh, being aware of that um, financial implications. You know, in Berlin, for example, they can reopen um, a theatre at a much more reduced capacity because they have that funding. Obviously, in the UK, we can't do that. So many. Um, theatres and performance venues cannot open at reduced capacity. Um, we have the, the challenge between sometimes there's local and sometimes there's national guidance um, and the risk of resurgence. This morning we heard from Seoul, they closed, they reopened and now they're reclosing again. Um, opportunities though is actually, this is a chance to look at actually, to look at opening hours and actually how can you have a much longer opening hour. Um, in, in Amsterdam, lots of organisations are coming together and collaborating. And finally, culture on my doorstep, much more about focusing on local. And one thing that we probably will follow up with you, that London and Partners have today um, launched uh, a new campaign, Because I'm a Londoner, which is all about trying to get different sectors as they reopen to really encourage the public to come out and support uh, different organisations. That's great, Aki. Thank you so much. Um, I uh, just want to pause for a few seconds so that we can now allow Ali and Joe to um, swap over. Great. Um, uh, I've just got a, um, a, a quick question for you. Someone has asked if, these, if it's possible to share these slides, um, Jackie, and I wondered if, we, if that's possible. Yeah, that's not a problem. Okay, fantastic stuff. Thank you so much. Just to, really useful to hear that bigger picture and especially what's happening with places opening and then reclosing down and the change from 10 meters down to one and uh, how we might be heading in that direction. Thank you. I'm going to hand over now to Patrick Harrison, who's the executive director at English National Ballet, um, and also Andy Reynolds, who's the medical director there. So Patrick and Andy, over to you too. Thank you, Emma. I'll take no longer than kind of three or four minutes, if that's okay, and then Great. Um, leave time. I, I actually can't see Andy on the call, um, so if he's around, he can unmute himself and make himself known, but I can't see him. I'll scroll through everybody. I am here, Patrick. So oh, hello, Andy. Hello, hello. Hopefully my mug has popped up, so I'm here. Perfect. Nice to see you. Um, so Andy and I don't have a presentation to rival Jackie's, I'm afraid, in terms of uh, visuals, but we, what we were hoping to do is Andy was going to speak for a couple of minutes about the, the impact of sustained lockdown on dancers' bodies from a medical director point of view. Um, and then I was just going to pick up and talk about the steps that we're taking uh, in terms of maintaining COVID security of our building, which actually isn't a venue, but it's a large space designed to kind of encourage lots of different people to be in it. So it's still a, a good case study. And then we were just going to, as you said earlier, Emma, just talk about the impact and what we're doing about things as a touring company in particular. But um, Andy, I'll let, I'll let you speak first about the medical aspects. Perfect. Patrick, can you hear me? Or can everyone else hear me? I assume we can. 
Um, so I think what I wanted to say was how I want everyone to appreciate and sort of for my job is to try and make the company appreciate how quickly the dancers will have deconditioned. Um, this research and motion comes from other sports and clearly they're not sports people, but they are at the top of their game, top of their performance and their bodies are obviously their, are their tool. So we have to realise that this long period that most of them will never have ever have been for this long of not being able to dance, not being able to dance efficiently will have really taken its toll on the dancer's body of being able to come back and jump back straight into where they were. So there's good research that says within 14 days of any sports person or dancer, they will start seeing a drop off in, in their body or in their performance. So for how long they've been, we need to really pay consideration to how we bring them back to uh, full fitness. Uh, most of the research I allude to would be from Australia. There's a white paper out from Purdom in 2015 that clearly shows a linear relationship. But the longer the intensity and the longer the drop of training is, the longer you must take to, to, to build back your dancer back to full um, ability to do from 10.30 in the morning to 6.30 or whatever their normal dance routine would be. Um, the return needs to be planned as well. It's, it's something that I would class as periodization, but what that basically means is breaking and planning the, their, their training into bite-sized bits that will progress and build upon the, the one previously to that. So the initial phase that we would be looking at would just have bar that would increase in intensity, but also in time. So we may only start at 40 minutes and build up to an hour, an hour and a half, but then also the intensity of what they're doing into it. So will they be having point work straight away? Will they not? Um, we will then generally add quite a lot of strength and conditioning because this is a different type of exposure to the dancers, but it isn't as risky as the dance. So we can build their time on feet and build in the studio at the same time. So we'll use both of them together. This will last about four weeks. They then will have a time where they'll be able to deload. So they'll have a week where they'll drop off and not uh, hopefully get away and actually enjoy some time away. And then we'll build back up for another four to five week block where then rehearsal preparation will come. And this will be a preparation that the artistic team will derive that will also build with time and intensity that will allow us to get ready for whatever rehearsal prep we would be wanting to do sorry whatever we rehearse we want to be able to do um, at the end of it and I've sort of said to the team that we'll be looking around a, an eight to ten week block of total time so four or five weeks of SNC bar work um, and then four to five weeks of preparation work that will then allow them to be back into pretty much a full repertoire of their dance um, I suppose why we do this um, is there's some really clear evidence that the dancers would get injured if we don't allow them to slowly build back up. They, they rely on their ability to dance for you know, long periods of time because they've done it every day for their life and they've built up the resilience over a period of time. We've now taken that, um, that carpet away from them because they haven't been able to maintain what they have been doing and they've literally been stuck in their kitchens, their lounges, or whatever they've been trying to do. And it's nothing to do with them being professional, it's that they just physically don't have the space to be able to work like they normally do. Um, so we are, we've taken this approach to really try and minimize the injury risk because the last thing we wanted to do as a company is to be able to start putting on some kind of performance in the future, but then not have any of our top dancers ready to dance because they picked up an injury. Um, and this model is sort of quite uh, prolific through every uh, sports organization but is obviously slowly coming into dance um, with the sports medicine being uh, linking with the sports dance medicine side of it. Thanks Andy, great. Um, Patrick do you want to come in? Absolutely yeah no I, if, if I could, um, talk about what the the steps that Andy and I have been taking with other colleagues around COVID security so um, Andy and I have been in uh, chairing a group of, of individuals within English National Ballet to try and work out what, what um, we need to put in place to be COVID secure and to let initially our dancers back into the building. So we're planning a COVID secure return to work plan that has three phases and the first phase is to get the dancers back in for that six to eight weeks of strength and conditioning that Andy's talking about. The challenge of how um, directed rehearsals happen is a, is a very different challenge. It's more complicated and we're hoping to buy ourselves a bit of time whilst the dancers are getting back to fitness. Um, but I just wanted to explain some of the key mitigators that we are putting in place to try and be COVID secure and to try and reassure our dancers that it's safe to come back other than the two meter rule, which we will be able to enforce for the strength and conditioning phase, but not for rehearsal. Um, so we are, um, zoning, kind of having bubble, but uh, we're having bubbles of dancers. There will be no more than eight in a studio, which means we can maintain distancing. We are doing um, a, a regime of self um, symptom checking, but we will also be checking all of our employees 
at on arrival at the building so we're doing we've got a, a second line of defense in terms of symptom checks we are going to be requiring all dancers to have face coverings whilst they're in class and doing their strength and conditioning work um, as Jackie referred to earlier there's a much enhanced cleaning regime and a series of spot checks that will be done by a series of designated uh, employees and we're also doing quite a lot of education of the employees and the dancers before they return so we're doing a series of kind of how-to videos that we think will help enhance the learning before they come back so that's really the key areas i thought it was worth highlighting security great thank you patrick um i just want to allow the signers to hand over before i ask two questions so can we just have a pause to allow that to happen again we're just trying to are you all right joe you right to keep going? Okay, <laughs> ignore me. So there were a couple of questions, Patrick. One was about the psychological impact mm -hmm. on artists um, and dancers and, and just how and if that has been taken into consideration. Um, and the second was about a contingency plans for a potential second wave. Yeah, I, I'm actually going to, if I may, answer the second question in a second when I talk about what we're planning in terms of artistic schedule, because we have considered that in that respect. Briefly, if you can. Yes, it, and in terms of the holistic, holistic um, welfare of the dancers, yes, absolutely. We're thinking as much about mental well-being and, and nutrition as we are physical well-being. So yes, that's part and parcel of Andy's medical regime. Great. Um, I, if I show, for just for one minute, talk about the touring company. <laughs> Go on. Okay, uh, so as a touring company, the, the challenges are, number one, touring is probably last of the heap when it comes to looking at the return to normal. So below return to uh, rehearsal and performance in your own venue, that's a problem. At uh, the scale of the touring network is a problem. It's often large companies playing to, to relatively cramped Victorian opera houses, that's a problem. And the third big challenge is everybody's facing at the moment, the economic logic of dormancy is, is compelling if you only look at things objectively and financially, which we obviously mustn't do. Um, so just to give you some examples of what English National Ballet is doing as a touring company to try and mitigate those problems. First, we are artistically trying to, scale, to, to create scalable repertoire. So the question was about second wave. What we're doing is we're taking our large scale work and we're making sure that we can do it on a smaller basis or we're commissioning a new commission that could go on stage if a venue is ready, but if, it, if the venue isn't ready or if there's a second spike, it can be translated to digital. So scalability is really the main, the, the main protection. Um, we're also looking at um, the, the transfer to digital, as you can imagine, and really just trying to create units of content that can work digitally, whether it's paid for or free to access, but can also be given to venues to help them with their reactivation strategies at the point at which they're ready. Great, great. Thank you. We've got um, a question about sector support that I might take on to uh, later on. Um, and another one we'll come back to because I want to just make sure we've got time for all the speakers. So thank you very much both to uh, Patrick and Andy. Thank you. Um, you mentioned digital just then, um, but I would like to hand over to um, John Z if you're there, John Z, in the room. Um, Joe, should we hand over back to Ali now? You're okay? Oh, one more, okay. John Z, um, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello, darling, welcome. So you have just um, run a digital version of Breaking Convention, which is your international hip hop festival. And I just wondered if you'd share with us um, how that went and what you learned from it. Sure. Um, breaking convention, if you haven't been, it's a very immersive, interactive type event. Um, once you walk into the space, you'll see that the whole space is filled with graffiti. Um, you've got little ciphers, DJs playing by the side and loads of people dancing. Um, so it's not just about walking into the theatre space and then seeing a piece of work. Also, the day is very long as well. Um, nonetheless, we wanted to reflect that in the digital version. So we made a three hour, um, a lot of work that we figured, oh man, but three hours, people aren't going to watch that. Actually, I think it's much nicer 
to be able to watch three hours worth of work indoors where you can pause, where you can forward, where you can rewind, rather than have someone locked into a space where they have to sit through that piece. Do you know what I mean? So from that angle, that wasn't a problem. Um, the other thing that uh, was really enjoyable was the fact that Breaking Convention is a modular show. So what we're able to do is look back into our archive of so much work that we've made over the years and to be able to pick and choose from them little gems that sometimes people might have forgotten about. Um, there was a bit of a challenge in that so much of the music at Breaking Convention is very sensitive when it comes to recording rights and, and all of that PRS staff. So we had to go through each piece to check that it wouldn't be a, make an alert and then blank out halfway through the shows. So actually the positive side of that was that we're able to feature work with original music, um, which is something that I've, I'm trying to push anyway in relation to hip hop dance in the theater as, as well. Um, um, I personally really enjoyed the hosting aspect of it because generally I would come on after every one or two pieces, um, get the crowd hype, um, and just to know that I couldn't do that with this Breaking Convention Festival m kind of encouraged me to make a little short video that was quite bespoke for the vest festival itself. If you haven't seen it, uh, what can I do? I can leave a link, actually. I'll leave a link um, in, the, um, in the message box for you to have a look at that, that was um, created specifically um, during the lockdown period so it reflect it referenced that and it was a great intro to breaking convention which is what um we usually do so that was fun um a uh, couple of notes i've got here this isn't a long one guys um the hosting part of it and filming my hosting segments on my balcony was really important because we wanted to give that real sense of it being live um, and that and the, it was in a very immediate um, environment. And we didn't want it to feel like it was recorded, even though it was. Um, so that was really important. Um, I really enjoyed changing my clothes after every segment, because I've always wanted to do that at Breaking Convention, but there's never quite enough time. But fortunately, we're able to really plan every single outfit, so that was cool. Um, um, Another thing that was really good was old work that was unseen. Because sometimes, um, because of the full program um, within a weekend at Breaking Convention, <clears throat> sometimes we lose them little gems. Um, and it was really, really good to look back on all of the work and be like, oh, look at that piece. It would be really good to show that one again. So, so that was really um, fun. Um, and also, it was great to be able to keep the show up for the duration of the tour that we ended up doing immediately after. Because quite often I've noticed that whenever I've seen live stuff that goes up online, it will stay out for maybe a maximum of a week. But um, we felt it was really important to, to keep it for the, the tour. So all of the people that would have went to Breaking Convention um, at, the end, at the beginning of June, they were able to still have that chance. Um, when you say tour, Johnsy, what do you mean? So we toured Breaking Convention around the UK. We always tour three acts um, from around the world. And we work with three acts or six acts, actually, in each venue nearby. So but, we, but this year, were you, when you say touring, you mean digital? Or? No, what I mean is we were meant to be touring this year, the tour got cancelled. So we wanted to keep the footage up for a month, which was the duration of how long the tour would have been. Okay, sorry, been a bit thick, I've got <laughs> it now. <laughs> Great, really good to hear. Um, I just want to check in with Joe. Joe, should we move back to Ali and give you a rest? Yep. So just a, just a moment's pause before we um, come back. There she is. You ready to roll, Ali? Great. Okay. Um, so, um, Johnsy, lots of compliments about those videos. 
Um, I, I just had a quick question before we move on to our, our final um, speaker. Um, and that is just how much planning it took to readjust your thinking because the lockdown came only a few months, two months beforehand. Um, and I just wondered how you managed both in terms of your thinking, planning and budgets. If you, for example, are using live music, how did that all pan out for you? Well, we are very active online anyway. We put a lot of footage out. We always got little bits and pieces. We always make sure our stuff is filmed really well with at least two cameras. So we were always in a position to be able to translate the breaking convention experience digitally anyway. Um, also hip hop culture, it really thrives online you really see a lot of hip hop dance styles developing online and translating online and being shared online. So I figured that breaking convention, we were already halfway there when it comes to the accessibility of hip hop and theatre within an online capacity. You've disappeared, Emma. No, no, I'm here. We had a fabulous intervention, but it's gone away. We're all still here. We're hearing you. No, it's good. And it's true. I mean, you're always really active there and got a good following. So it's a good place to start from. Um, great. There's several questions about digital and monetizing digital. We might come back to those in a minute. But thank you so much, John Z. I want to hand over to our final speaker. Um, and that's Polly Wisbridger, who is um, the Chief Exec and Artistic Director of East London Dance. So Polly, are you there in the room? Yeah, sure am. Um... Hello, uh, it is Alice. so lovely to see everybody but feel so far away at the same time so <laughs> lots of people in this space that I need to catch up with um, <laughs> but I'm going to talk briefly about uh, what Islam Dance has been going through over the last few months and the questions we've been asking ourselves going forwards great um, so lockdown for me started actually while I was still off on maternity leave so feeling distant anyway coming back you know with with babies and toddlers in the house was a really weird time to return to work um, the team worked really quickly and proactively and we shifted, you know, the organisation to remote working. But then we really wanted to take some time to think about what happens to our programmes. So we decided early on that we really wanted to focus in on our existing communities of those uh, dancers, artists, participants, young and old. And we knew that there were going to be some significant challenges that they were facing. Um, and so we started by talking. Literally, the team picked up the telephone, rang people and asked them how they were. Um, but also really to understand what they need going forwards and what role East London Dance can play through that. So it was clear that people were facing social isolation. People were isolating on their own. There were some really significant digital engagement barriers, uh, you know, one, one device per household, limited data access. Um, so particularly for young people, there was challenges about how they were going to engage online. Uh, loss of income, financial insecurity, absolutely at the heart of anxiety for artists and, and families and parents uh, that we were talking to. Um, and I think all of that, you know, was clearly manifesting itself through through different mental health issues, uh, loneliness, anxiety. But as we all know, dance is the most amazing tool for supporting that, for bringing people together, uh, for supporting physical and mental well-being. So then we asked ourselves, how are we going to do that remotely? Um, so we spent time actually researching and planning all the online safeguarding, testing, uh, rehearsing delivery before actually launching anything. Um, so our programme over the last few months have, has included everything from coffee mornings with our older dancers, writing how to Zoom guides for them. Uh, we devised and filmed dance challenges that, sent, that we sent out to people running online competitions to send moves back. We moved all our training and professional development programmes online. Um, and then we launched our On The Move at Home programme of classes for young people. Um, and at the moment, we're really lucky. We've got a youth support worker on our team. Um, she's trained, you know, trained specialist to, for working with young people. And so alongside all of that, we've been able to offer one-to-one -one coaching sessions, uh, small group chats, as well as offering support to parents and families. So we find ourselves as a dance organisation uh, providing actually a really vital support network for people. Um, I think the civic role of us as, as organisations has become so amplified during this time. And I think really needs to continue to be celebrated and, and highlighted as we, as we start to emerge from lockdown. 
Um, we do know that some of our community don't have access to digital devices and so are missing out at the moment. And so one of the things we've been looking at is how do we, you know, raise the funds to, to get that technology out to people that, that need it. Um, and then, you know, we're in the phase now where we're thinking about what next, how do we emerge back into the studio? How do we physically reconnect with people? And actually, how do we learn from that fast move online um, that we've gone through over the last few months? So it's got to start with our workforce. We've got to invest in and support the artists, the producers, the staff teams out there as they return for their, as they prepare for their return to work. And it has to encompass, as you've heard already, about the physical fitness, but also that emotional well-being and, and, and vitally the financial security for, for our sector. So as we consider start getting back into the studio, I think we do need some sector-wide clarity and guidelines about how to do that safely but we should also understand that every community is unique every company is unique and so it's going to it, you know it's going to need conversation and dialogue and we need to get people's confidence uh, there to get them back into the studios and the theatres um, it would be crazy if we all started setting up our own training programs setting up our own guidelines and so i think you know one of jacqueline's questions in inviting me to speak was you know what role could the gla play what role can partnership play so i think really thinking about a joined up offer for london in terms of 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 those guidelines and training actually for the workforce uh, for black and asian artists who are at more risk from covid or those with underlying health conditions i think we need to make sure they're not left behind in that return to work for people that might need to take more time in sheltering and that that sufficient income is there to to re retain those people in the sector i think i think we're at real risk of losing some vital voices simply that they can't afford to survive um, and so as we start to open back up again, we need to make sure that all the development and all the leaps forward with the, the dance sectors made in terms of diversity, equality, representation aren't lost through this time. Um, Thank you, Polly. We're going to have to um, move on just to allow <laughs> some time for open questions. But I have one question for you. Uh, you mentioned about sort of amplified civic responsibility, and I just wondered um, in terms of the imaginative things you've been doing in response now just how much do you think it's going to change uh your program going forwards in the longer term i think you know i think we're looking at a blended a blended offer actually i think there's some things that have worked really well and have got more reach i think things like the online coaching sessions actually have got young people into the space and and present and and work really well um, so, you know, I think that that's where we are looking forwards. Um, I think there's been some amazing skill sharing stuff. So really having those kind of open forums, um, you know, of skills exchange, you know, furloughed staff supporting artists working, you know, independent producers out there in this space, absolutely supporting artists to, to secure funds. So I think all of that energy around skill sharing, brokering needs to sort of continue going forwards as well. Great. Great, thank you. Um, before we open up now to just pick up on some of the questions, um, Ali, are you all right? Should we change over to Joe? You all right for a little bit longer? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Um. Uh, so um, um, we'll just allow Joe to step in for this last bit. There she is, brilliant, okay. Um, so one of the questions that came up was um, about how the sector can support um, freelance dancers to get back to a similar regime to get safe um, in their, um, uh, for their training and to get back into um, good physical shape. Um, and it would just be nice to hear from any of the speakers if they have any thoughts about either if they know of any schemes that are going on now and I, I suppose I'm thinking about cross uh, all the different styles that we've had talked about today um, but I wonder if anybody here knows of any different kinds of training which could be helpful for freelance dancers to get back um, into into shape um, yes uh, about a month ago five weeks ago um, there were regular classes being held by Boy Blue Entertainment 
led by Kenrick Sandy. Um, he invited me in and it was part of the um, Boy Blue Entertainment family, I guess. Um, but it was a real great way of engaging with the community and training as well and feeling as though you're part of a group. Um, it was really, really excellent. Um, he hasn't been doing them recently, but um, look out for them when he starts again. Great. Thanks, John. See, that's good to know. But we might try and see if we can um, get links up to Boy Blue for anyone that doesn't know them. We could find out what they're, what they're doing. Um, the only thing I would say as well would be just use yeah. time for the dancers, the individual dancers. They can use time of dance to specifically just build back up. So, you know, there's quite a few online classes out there. Um, just to use time of progressively build back up to what they need to be doing rather than just assuming 30 minutes of dance. And then, you know, when they've got a contract, then they're going to be dancing all day. Try and use, get, prepare themselves and look forward to what they're going to be doing when when they, you know, when they finally find somewhere, that's what I would use. Because it's quite difficult finding a metric in dance apart from time, if I'm honest. And are there particular, um, did, you, what, did you call, was it called time to dance, did you say? Uh, yeah, no, I'm just, just saying, mean I'm just saying giving in, themselves in, time. time. Yes, you know, okay. that's what I would say just from a medical point of view, just try not to assume that you're going back to full. If you, if you know you've got a contract starting in X amount of time, try and lead forwards to that and plan, plan backwards and um, know how long you're going to be dancing on your feet for at that stage to then to, to then plan backwards and slowly build back up over a period of time. That's great. There's various comments here. There's a class for a cause. It's class for freelancers to teach and participate in classes that's in the cheat in the chat, sorry, from Flora. Um, and uh, various other hints. Um, Kate Scanlon's also organizing something. There's a question from Nadine. Nadine, do you want to come in and ask it about um, transport and venues? Yeah, well, a, a long-term problem is going to be um, public transport, which is a very sort of London-specific question. And I just wondered if it's an opportunity for um, venues to, to sort of partner or networks to partner in a way, which, I don't know, I mean, I'm talking on top of my head, but you'd have the face and Streatham tied up to uh, Sadler's Wells, and it would give greater access to those spaces and audiences, while people are able to go from north to south to east to west and to centre just to think of different ways um, of partnering both in terms of access for the participants and future audiences. Yeah great thank you. I thought um, there are some interesting things I, uh, with what Jackie's presentation about just how differently um, different countries are working. Jackie are you still with us? I know she had some other commitments so she might have had to leave already. Um, but I did think it is. I'm sorry, I'm here. Oh, you're yeah. here, darling. Hello. I just wondered, from your point of view, who you think is 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 coping with both this idea of transports and venues and audiences particularly well around the world. Um, I don't know. We've not heard. I mean, London, I know, is because I know that Alba are doing all this this surveying, this sentiment surveying, and I think like you know, fifty to sixty percent of. Londoners will, are not happy to go back on the tube or on the on buses so that is a real challenge so I think this whole focus that's why the London and partners campaign is all about go local um, I know there were quite a lot of other cities that are saying you know I think in um, oh, Milan was all basically everything should be within 15 minutes so I think it's, it's a bit too early to say at the moment, but I think a lot of cities are trying to focus on the actually explore your local area, you know, rather than going into the centre of London. It's, it's, and so it's also, it's about people becoming aware of what's on their doorstep. So I think that's really what we've got to focus on to get people yeah. more. Um, yeah, I think the local is, is going to, I think it, one of the lasting legacies will be importance of that. I've just got a note from Michelle, um, who's uh, talking about um, guidelines in Australia. And I know quite a lot of people I'm hearing both from One Dance UK and elsewhere asking the government for clarity on guidelines for us. Michelle, I wonder if you'd just like to share about the, the, the national guidelines framework from Ausdance. Sure. Hi. Thanks for letting me be with you, everyone, um, as I'm kind of marooned here in the UK, my original homeland. Um, I work for Ausdance, which is a peak body for Australia, and it's a federated system, so a little bit complex. I won't bore you with that. So we're dealing with guidelines for both the federal level and every state then has their own secondary guidelines, different timings, different restrictions, different government processes. 
Um, so it's been, um, what would the polite word be? Interesting. Um, it is a national level. We've written a national guidelines and framework for the safe return to dance that's basically anyone that's going into a studio. So whether you're a small business owner, a dance studio, whether you're Chunky Move, the Australian Ballet, et cetera. Um, they have been released and we've had them endorsed by the federal government. We've had the chief medical officer uh, for the federal government and the Australian Institutes of Sport also endorse them. Uh, each state, some review dance within the arts and culture framework for restrictions and some we have to be under the, the banner of sport which a lot of people are miffed about, but you know, as long as I can get those things through, you know, just getting people back to dance safely is our main objective. We're very happy to share those guidelines and we're currently rotating state by state guidelines and some states require an entire industry plan. So today we've just been doing the usual advocating and lobbying for all the different ministers, health, sport, the economy, to get some exemption made. Um, here they've been doing some interesting rules around you have to keep the two meter distancing, which is fair, four meter squared rule, which is fine. But then in terms of if you're it underneath sport, you apparently could only have 10 people doing an activity at once, even with that rule. So of course that's quite ridiculous and no logic compared to, because imagine you're in a gym and you're on a treadmill next to each other. So. Today we've had a couple of wins, I think Sunday night, that rule has been um, given an exemption in the state of New South Wales. Tomorrow I expect confirmation of uh, the ministers in Victoria to give them an exemption. Um, and we've got some special exemptions through for our companies as well that are much larger, whether they're Sydney Dance Company or the Australian Ballet. So that's okay. where we're up to. All right, that's really that's useful scary. to hear. Thank you so much. There's quite a lot of links to other classes and connections. Um, also talks about what can be done outside, not waiting for government, but just going to move on ourselves. Um, Zinzi, you were there with a question about freelancers. I think we can squeeze in um, one more. So Zinzi, yeah. over um, to you, darling. Thank you. I wanted to just come back on the question, the comment that was in the chat about how do we support freelance dancers to get back into shape? I feel like a lot of the responses are about free classes, which are relying on other dancers giving their free labor. And of course, if you can donate, you do, but actually it's free class and they're at home. What I think the question is about and the question I have is how do I, as a freelance dancer who rely on open class, my physio on the other side of London, I live in South London, my physio is in Olympic Village. How do I get back into pineapple? How do we as freelancers get support to access what is often quite an expansive plan that we've had to put in place in order to be fit. Often the Arts Council will not fund these things. Like it's only recently after 10 years of writing grants for the arts that I've been able to fund all of my rehearsals, all of my classes and pay a physio and pay for the gym. That, my, that was my first G for A. Generally, the Arts Council will not let you put that kind of stuff in. With this much time off, freelance dancers are so vulnerable. We're going to be so deconditioned. We earn less money. We have less industry support. The more of us are black and brown with underlying conditions. We're not getting the same financial support. And I think that question is asking that, how is industry going to support us? Otherwise, we're going to drop how. We don't have teams and we don't have buildings. And, mm -hmm. and I, I want to know how... I am going to be able to stay in dance if I don't have the incredible skills of Andy and a director like Patrick to support me to get back on stage. Great, it's really good to hear Zizi. Thank you for bringing it up. Tomorrow we're gonna to be looking um, at dancers and um, choreographers and performers and how that works as, in terms of makers. And I think maybe it's something key that we can um, talk about there in terms of what as a sector we can do to try and support those freelancers um, and uh, help address some of those issues that you raise. Um, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I think we are coming uh, right to the um, end of our, our time. There's lots of comments about what uh, Zinzi has, has just said and the importance of how, how, how vulnerable people who are there without um, indep working independently without the frames of, of bigger organizations. Um, so I think it's something that I'd really like us to return to um, tomorrow for those of you that can join us again. So many questions here, Rose, that I feel like um, it's something that we need to 
make more time for. And one of the things I was wondering was whether we should make these sessions something monthly that might lead um, just even taking us up to Christmas. So if you think it would be interesting to do this on a more regular basis to just share ideas, connections and to hear needs of people, then um, do drop us a line and, and let us know. Um, Emma, sorry, can I just point out, I know we've had a lot of questions, we've got questions from Assis, from Raymond, a lot coming in the chat, we, we, we can, we will be pulling those questions off the chat, so we can do that, so is that something that we can, we, can we go back to those questions and try and address some of those offline, do you think, is that possible? Yep, absolutely, we can try and do that. Right. Um, I would like to say a huge thank you to all the speakers. Um, I'd like to thank um, Ali and Joe in particular for topping and tailing. We got there in the end. Um, I think there's many more conversations to continue. We'll be back tomorrow. Um, we've got um, One Dance UK. Andrew Hurst is going to fill us in um, and do an overview at the beginning in terms of where things stand with the government. Um, and then we've got um, four artists speaking. We've got Akram Khan, Rosemary Lee, Shobhana Jay Singh and Janifa Jean Charles. So they'll all be with us tomorrow and I hope you can come back and join us. Thank you very much and uh, more soon. Bye bye. <laughs>